I discovered something 10, 12 years ago, <clears throat> and it turned my life upside down, revolutionized my life. Uh, I became a new man. So this is what I'm going to share with you. Uh, happy to share it with you. Uh, in a special kind of way, though, because you might say to me, how come you heard this just 10 or 12 years ago? Hadn't you read the Gospels? <laughs> of course I'd read the Gospels, but I hadn't seen it. It was right there, but I hadn't seen it. Later, having discovered it, see, I found it in all the major religious writings. And I'm amazed. I mean, I, I was reading it, and I hadn't recognized it, hadn't seen it. Uh, I wish to God I'd found this when I was younger, like most of you. Oh, what a difference it would have made. So how long would it take to give it to you? A whole day? Well, I'll be honest with you. A couple of minutes. <laughs> I don't think it would take more than two minutes. Giving it to you wouldn't take more than a couple of minutes, I don't think. Grasping it or getting it might take you 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, 10 minutes, one day, three days, who knows? Who knows? That depends on you. Uh, if you would bring one quality to this uh, little session we're having here together today, just one, you need one quality to see what I sort of saw 10 years ago and what revolutionized my life. Uh, various people have told me hence, uh, since then that their lives were pretty much revolutionized too. Uh, but not too many people, I'm sorry to say, very few. Uh, I tend to think that if about, let's say, 1,000 people are listening to me and one hears it, that's a pretty good average, pretty good average. Is it difficult to hear? Is it difficult to understand? It's so simple, a seven-year-old child could understand it. Isn't that amazing? And in fact, when I, I, I think of it today, I think, why didn't I see it? I don't know. I don't know why I didn't see it, but I didn't. Now, maybe one or other of you might see it today or might see part of it. What would you need to see it? Just one thing, the ability to listen. That's all. Are you able to listen? If you can, you might get it. Now, listening is not as easy as you might think it is. Reason. We're always listening from kind of fixed concepts, fixed positions, prejudices. See, listening does not mean swallowing. What I want you to do is question everything I'm saying, uh, think about it, come back at me, feel free to do that. See, even while I'm talking, ask questions, raise your hands anytime. I'd be happy to do this kind of dialogue with you. So it does not mean gullibility, but then listening doesn't mean attacking, see, because I'm going to say something so new, some of you are going to think I'm crazy, I'm out of my mind. <laughs> so then you're going to be tempted to attack. If you tell a Marxist there's something wrong with Marxism, the first thing he's likely to do is attack you. You tell a capitalist there's something wrong with capitalism, he's up in arms. You tell an American, hey, you know, there's something wrong with the United States. And the same with the Indian, if you're attacking India, etc. Doesn't mean swallowing, doesn't mean attacking, doesn't mean agreeing. You're alert, you're watching, you're listening with a kind of a fresh mind. That's not easy either. Listening with a fresh mind, without prejudices, without fixed formulas. All right. If you are ready to hear something new, simple, new, unexpected, 
against almost everything you've been told till now. You ready to hear that? Then maybe you'll hear what I have to say. Maybe you'll get it. You know, when Jesus taught the good news, I think he was attacked not only because what he taught was good, but because it was new. We hate anything new. I hated anything new. I don't want to hear anything new. Give me the old stuff. We don't like the new. It's too disturbing. Too liberating. Okay. <clears throat> so the ability to listen. Buddha formulated it beautifully. He says, monks and scholars must accept my words not out of respect, must not accept my words out of respect, but must analyze them the way a goldsmith analyzes gold, by cutting, scraping, rubbing, melting. Uh, you know, it's interesting, I frequently reflected the human mind is such an extraordinary thing. It has invented uh, the computer. It has split the atom. It sends ships into space. It has not solved the problem of human suffering, of anguish, loneliness, emptiness despair. You're pretty young, most of you. But I honestly don't think you're strangers to loneliness, heartache, emptiness, depression, despair. How come we haven't found the answer to that? We've made all kinds of technological advances. Has that raised the quality of our living by one inch? Want to know my opinion? No. Not one inch. Oh, we have more comfort, more speed, pleasures, entertainments, that's right, more erudition greater technological advances. What I'm saying is, any improvement on that loneliness and emptiness and heartache, any improvement on that greed and hatred and conflict, less fighting, less cruelty, if you want my opinion, I think it's worse. And the tragedy is, as I discovered 10 or 12 years ago, the secret has been found. They discovered the atom. We don't have to go in search of solving it. We got the solution. Why don't we use it? We don't want it. <laughs> That's why. Would you believe that? We don't want it. We don't want it. Can you imagine my saying to somebody, look, I'm going to give you a formula which would make you happy for the rest of your life. You'll enjoy every single minute of the rest of your life. Imagine my saying that to you, okay? I'm going to say that to you today. I'm going to give you the formula. I'm going to give it to you. You know what most of you are going to do? Sorry for insulting you in advance, okay? But if you're anything, <laughs> if you're anything like the audiences I've had till now, you know what most of you are going to do? You're saying, stop it. Don't tell me. Stop it. Don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And you don't even have to take that on faith. I'm going to prove it to you. You're going to prove it to me before the end of today. Oh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Do what? <laughs> you don't want it. Okay, let's suppose you want to grasp it. Let's suppose you want to see it. What do you have to do? A, <clears throat> understand a couple of truths about yourself. Then I'll throw the formula at you. <laughs> You make what you want of it. So here goes. What do you have to understand about yourself? First, your life is in a mess. Don't like to hear that? Well, maybe it proves that it's true. 
your life is in a mess. Maybe you'll say to me, maybe, if you're like the average person I run into, your life is in a mess. People will say to me, what do you mean my life is in a mess? I'm doing pretty well in my studies. I got good parents. I got good relations with my family. I've got a boyfriend. I've got a girlfriend. Uh, everybody likes me. I'm doing well at sports. And I have a pretty brilliant career ahead of me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Do you think your life is not in a mess? He says, no. All right, tell me. Here's the acid test. Ever feel lonely? Any heartache? Ever get upset by anything? You mean, aren't we supposed to get upset? You want the clean, clear, simple answer? Yeah, no. You mean not be upset by anything? That's right, you heard me. No. Shut up. I don't want to hear any more. See what I mean? No. He got a theory. He's got a theory. You got to be upset or you're not human. <laughs> okay, go ahead and be upset. Good luck. <laughs> Bye. You know, there's a lovely saying by one of your American authors, which I, I frequently quote. He says, don't teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and irritates the pig. <laughs> I had to learn the lesson the hard way. I've stopped trying to teach pigs to sing. You don't want to hear what I'm saying? Bye. No arguments. They don't argue. I'm ready to explain, ready to clarify. Why try to argue? Not worth it. So, <clears throat> ever suffer any interior conflict? You mean all your relationships are going well with everybody? Well, no. Your life is in a mess. You mean you're enjoying every single minute of your life? Well, not quite. Well, see what I told you? It's in a mess. <laughs> Why argue? I'm not interested in arguing with you, period. I know because I was doing that all along. Not interested in arguing. You either face the fact that your life is in a mess or you don't. You don't want to face it. I've got nothing to say to you. And your life is in a mess means you're a victim of heartache, at least occasionally. You feel lonely. There's emptiness staring at you. You're scared. You're scared? Yeah. Your life is in a mess. You mean we're not supposed to be scared? No, sir or madam, as the case may be. No. Not supposed to be scared. About anything? About anything. Fearlessness. You don't know what it means. And the tragedy is you don't think it's available. It's so easy to get. Since they told you it's not available, you never tried to find it. But it's right here all over the Bible, and you won't see it. Because they told you it's not available. Are you anxious for the future? Any whiff of anxiety, worry, upset? Yeah, you're in a mess. How about that? Want to clean it up? I'll clean it up for you in five minutes, depending on how ready you are. You don't have to move out of that chair. You could be sitting in that chair and you could clean it up in five minutes. And I mean that. This isn't a sales gimmick. I mean it. It's so simple and it's so deadly serious that people miss it. <laughs> and you could have it. You know, there's a... Do you know how they discovered the diamond mines in South Africa? It's a very interesting story. Uh, I read it some time back. This author says, I think it was an American, a guy, a white man who was there in South Africa, was sitting at the hut of the headman of one of these South African villages. And he sees the kids <clears throat> there playing uh, with what looked like marbles. And his heart skipped a beat when he recognized that those weren't marbles at all. They were diamonds. He picked a couple of them up. Diamonds. So he says to the village headman, he says, uh, could you give me some of these? You know, I've got children back home who play this sort of game too, and yours are a bit different. Could you, you know, I'd be ready to give you a pouch of tobacco for this. And the chief laughed. He said, look, this would be highway robbery. I mean, it'd be real robbery to take your tobacco for these things. We've got thousands of them here. So he gave him a basket full. The guy comes back, goes back with a lot of money, buys up all of that land, 
and within 10 years he's the richest man in the world. Now, you know, that could be a parable. It's, it's tragic, it's painful to think. I mean, I, I think back on my own life and I think, why did I waste it? I wasted it. Uh, let's suppose, let's suppose, this guy, huh? He's starving. The, these, these people who were sitting on top of those diamond mines, they're starving, their children are undernourished, etc. They're looking for food, they're begging, they're pleading with people to feed them. And someone says, hey, don't sell that property. You've got diamond mines. You see this thing? You see this thing? It's a diamond. You could sell it. You could get $100,000 for this. You, They say, him no diamond, him stone. He got it in his head that that's a stone. Refuses to listen. No, that's a stone. Now, that's the condition of people everywhere. They won't hear you. They won't listen. You're telling them life is extraordinary. Life is delightful. You could enjoy it. You wouldn't have a minute of tension. Not one. No pressure. No anxiety. You want it? Not possible. Never been done. Cannot be done. No spirit of research, of investigation. Let's find out. Let's go. No, no, no. Can't be done. Don't want to hear you. I mean, our priests have told us it can't be done. Our psychologists tell us it cannot be done. You coming to tell us it can be done? Out. <laughs> Too bad. All right. So the first thing, are you ready to admit that your life is in a mess? Second. This is a bit tougher, okay? You don't want to get out of it. You do not want to get out of the mess. You talk to any psychologist who's worth his name and he'll confirm that. The last thing a client wants is a cure. He doesn't want to get cured, he wants relief. Eric Byrne, one of your great psychiatrists here in the United States, puts it very graphically. I won't give his exact words because I'm a bit scared. You know, this is traveling... How much did he say? 44,000 miles? I better use a respectable language. He says, uh, he says, imagine a client who's up to his uh, nose in a cesspool, okay? Yeah, he calls it liquid S-H-I-T. So uh, uh, he's up to his uh, nose in, uh, in a cesspool, all right. And he's coming to you, and you know what he's saying to you? He's saying, could you help me so people won't make waves? Doesn't want to get out. Oh, no, 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 get out, for heaven's sake, no. Just help me so they won't make waves. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to get out. He doesn't. You want to test that on yourself? I'll give you a couple of minutes. You could do it right now. You want to test it on yourself? Okay, here goes. Suppose you could be blissfully happy, but you're not going to get that degree. Ready to barter your degree for happiness? You're not going to get that girlfriend of yours or that boyfriend. Ready to barter them for happiness? You know something? You're not going to be a success. You're going to fail. And everybody say, he's a bum. But you'll be happy. You'll be blissfully happy. Ready to barter the good opinion of people for that? Oh, no. I'll give you time to think about it later. Oh, no. No, sir, or madam. They don't want to get out of it. They don't want it. They don't want it. They don't want it. I don't want happiness. I want fame. I don't want happiness. I want to get that gold medal at the Olympics. Suppose I tell you, look, give up the gold medal. You'll be happy, damn it. What do you want that gold medal for? What do you want to be the top, the, the, the boss of the corporation for? I'll make you happy. On $10,000 a year, I'll make you happy. <gasps> No, 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 give me my money, my money, my money, my money. <laughs> See what I mean now? Now you're catching on. They don't want to be happy. They don't want to live. They want money. It was all there in the Sermon on the Mount. I discovered later. It's all there. I hadn't seen it. He lived like a king. What does it mean to live like a king? You know what idiots think it means? And the world is peopled with them, believe me. Idiots. You know what they think it means? It means moving around in limousines, having everybody curtsy to them and salute them and all that sort of rubbish, all that sort of garbage. 
have their names in the headlines. They think that means having power over people. They think that's what it means to live like a king. I'll tell you what I think it means. They're not living like kings. They're slaves. They're terrified. Look at their faces on television. For heaven's sake. Those kings and queens and presidents and the rest of them. Look at them on television. You'd recognize it at once. He's scared. You know why he's scared? Because he wants power. That's why. He wants prestige. He wants a reputation. That's why. He's not living like a king. I'll tell you what it means to live like a king. To know no anxiety at all. No inner conflict at all. No tensions. No pressures. No upset. No heartache. So then what are you left with? Happiness. Undiluted. People sometimes say, what do I do to be happy? You don't do anything to be happy, silly. It shows how bad your theological education has been that you think you've got to do something to be happy. You don't have to do anything to be happy. You can't acquire happiness. You know why? Because you have it. You got it right now. You got it. But you're the whole time blocking it in your stupidity. You're blocking it. Stop blocking it. You'll have it. If I could show you how to get rid of your conflicts, your anxieties, your tensions, your pressures, your emptiness, your loneliness, your despair, your depression, your heartache, you get rid of all of that, what are you left with? Sheer undiluted happiness. That's what you have. The Chinese put it beautifully. When the eye is unobstructed, they say, the result is sight. Don't do anything to get sight. When the eye is unobstructed, the result is sight. When the ear is unobstructed, the result is hearing. When the mouth is unobstructed, the result is taste. I will add later. When the mind is unobstructed, the result is truth. And when the heart is unobstructed, the result is joy and love. You've got it all, but it's obstructed. Drop it. So second major step. You don't want to get out of it. You want comfort. You want your little possessions. You want the little things that society has taught you are essential for happiness. False. You want that. You don't want to get out of the mess. Those are the things that are creating the mess. I'm going to give you something to talk about and to think of. It's this. Has it ever occurred to you that what you call your happiness is really your chain? Has it ever occurred to you that what you call your happiness, just think, what do you call your happiness? You're calling somebody your happiness? You are my joy. Uh, your marriage, your business, your degree, whatever. Where do you find your happiness? In whom do you find your happiness? Your prison. Let's pick up the thread again. Your life is in a mess. Don't want to get out of it. There was another thing. It's in a mess because you've got wrong ideas. Not because there's anything wrong with you. You're okay. And I'm okay, you're okay. We're all okay. We're great. There's nothing wrong with us. They put wrong ideas into our head. Somebody did. We needn't spend too much time, try, time trying to catch the culprit. But anyway, the fact is you got wrong ideas. You know, it's like somebody gives you a stereo set and you get a manual of instructions that comes along with it. Well, they didn't give us a manual of instructions when they gave us the gift of life. Or let's put it the other way. They gave us the manual of instructions. It was all wrong. So you're not getting music, you're getting scratchy sounds. You're getting upset, you're getting conflicts, you're getting loneliness, you're getting emptiness. All right, so what is the point? Now, there are many ways of putting the formula. I'm going to give you the simplest I found. I'm going to give it to you in the words of old Buddha. Why did I choose him? Because his is the simplest of all, but you find it everywhere. 
it's the simplest of all, uh, enunciated with limpid clarity. You're probably going to disagree with it, but you can't miss the point. Here it is. The world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is desire. The uprooting of sorrow is desirelessness. Oh, I'm looking at your faces. It's wonderful you're thinking. That's great. That's great. And you're thinking wrong. That's awful. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Because I know how, how I used to react to this. The world is full of sorrow. Great. Right. Agreed. The root of sorrow is desire. Well, all right. Now, what are you going to conclude? The uprooting of sorrow is desirelessness. So I'm going to be a vegetable? I mean, how do we live without desires? Ah, oh, you got it. See, I was on I got it. I got it. Let's give you a better translation. I mean, I, I don't think Buddha would be so foolish and stupid as to say he ought to have no desires, for heaven's sake. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have the desire to come here, right? I wouldn't be speaking if I didn't have the desire to speak. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have the desire to come and hear me. So let's, let's give, give it a better translation. The world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is attachment. The uprooting of sorrow means the uprooting, the dropping of attachment. You know, there are desires on whose fulfillment my happiness does not depend. You got lots of desires on whose fulfillment your happiness does not depend. Or else you'd be climbing walls, you'd be nervous wrecks. We all of us have two types of desires. We got desires, you know, we desire all kinds of things, and gee, we're, we're happy to get them. And we don't get them, okay, too bad. We're not unhappy. But we've got other desires. Good Lord, if we don't get that, we're going to be miserable. That's what he calls an attachment. Where do you think all conflicts come from? Attachments. Where do you think greed comes from? Attachments. Where do you think loneliness comes from? Attachment. Where do you think emptiness comes from? You got it. Same cause. Where do you think fears come from? My, how clever you're becoming. Attachments. No attachment, no fear. Ever thought of that? No attachment, no fear. We're going to take your life. Go right ahead. No attachment to life. Happy to live. Happy to let go. You think that's possible? You know something? People have attained it. So it is possible. Want to attain it yourself? <gasps> Attachment. Let me slip in another little secret. I'm going to cheat on old Buddha right now and slip another little one in while we're on this point. You know, when you enjoy the scent of a thousand flowers, you're not going to feel too bad about the absence of one. Nobody ever told you that in your culture, did they? They didn't tell me. When you enjoy the taste of a thousand dishes, you're not going to feel too bad about the absence of one. Do you recollect being educated to enjoy a thousand dishes so that nothing upsets you? See, we missed that. We got this. What do you know? Oh, no, no, no. You got to get this. That's what your culture and mine is training us for. We got the wrong instruction. They don't give a damn whether you and I are happy or not. 
They want us to achieve. They want us to produce. That's what they want. Even if we're going to be miserable slaves and unhappy. So, it's a big deal. You lost a friend. You got one million friends. No, not that kind. I want one personal, unique, unsubstitutable friend. So if he rejects me, then I'm miserable for the rest of my life. Good luck. Bye. Not teaching this big to sing. Too dangerous. <laughs> but that's the way we've been brought up. That's the way it has been for, for thousands of years. You've got to have desires on whose fulfillment your happiness depends. Very good for so-called progress, of course, huh? huh? Because you'll throw all you have into the, the, the enterprise. So-called progress. I call it so-called because that's not progress to me. That isn't progress. You mean, isn't it progress when we have jumbo jets and spaceships? Very clever. I'll tell you what is progress. Heart progress. Love progress. Happiness progress. You got that? Oh, sorry, we don't have that. You can keep the rest. What's the use of it? Tell me, what's the use? of moving around in aeroplanes with a heart that is full of misery and emptiness. Tell me, I'd rather live on the ground in a jungle and be blissfully happy and dancing all day. Wouldn't you? Maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. You see, you're really confronted with the choice of life or death. And what people call life is frequently death. And they don't know it. And you mean to tell me that if you've got attachments, you can love? The biggest enemy to love, attachments. Desire in the sense of attachment. You know why? Because if I desire you, I want to possess you. I can't leave you free. i got to get you i got to manipulate you so that I can get you, if I desire you in this way. I'm going to manipulate myself so that I can hoodwink you into getting you. You following what I'm saying? Yeah. Clear enough? Oh, yeah, you're on. All right, wonderful. So, then I got fears. You call this love? You call this love? I mean, you're lacking intelligence. Love, for heaven's sake. I'm not leaving you free. I'm not leaving me free. I'm manipulating you. I'm manipulating myself. I'm trying every means to get you. And, and there's fear. And so it is said so beautifully. Perfect love casts out fear. No fear in perfect love. You know why? Because there's no desire. Now, ask your culture. I've asked mine. Ask your culture if it may, can make any sense out of this statement. Where there is love, there is no desire. Desire in the sense of attachment, okay? Okay, attachment. You know what they tell you? But attachment is love. That's how stupid they are. Then you expect to find life. You can only find death and misery. You say, how... How could you love if you don't feel attachment? Later, I'll keep this for the end of the day, I'll talk explicitly about love. Such a simple, such a sublime, such an extraordinary thing. And I rarely run into anyone. Believe me, I, I'm serious. I mean every word I'm saying. I run into all kinds of people. I run into people of all kinds of religions, and I run into Catholics and, and non-religious people, you know, people who, who are atheists or whatever, and I run into Catholics or lay people and priests and sisters and bishops, and I rarely run into someone who knows what love is. They got the wrong instructions. So when I tell them, hey, how could love be attachment? They're arguing about it. And then, of course, after five minutes, they say, you're right. You mean you've lived 55 years, you've uh, written books on theology, and you haven't seen this? 
He says, no. Well, I'll give you some comfort. I lived about as much as you did, and I hadn't seen it either, if that's any comfort to you. But it's so obvious. Attachment meaning, without you, I will not be happy. Got to get you. Attachment means, I got to get you. If I don't get you, I won't be happy. I cannot be happy without you. There you've got the formula for divorce. There you've got the formula for quarrels. There you've got the formula for friendships falling apart. I cannot be happy without you. I need you for my happiness. By damn, I'll do everything to manipulate you to get you. <laughs> Love means I'm perfectly happy without you, darling. It's all right. And I wish you're good. And I leave you free. And when I get you, I'm delighted. And when I don't, I'm not miserable. What do you know? I have learned to be self-sufficient. I'm standing up on my own two feet, not leaning on you. And you know, if I get money, that's wonderful. And if I don't get money, I'm not depressed. I'm happy. And you know something else? When you go away, I don't... Maybe it's too soon to say that here. But anyway, I'll risk it. I don't miss you. I don't feel pain where there is sorrow. There is no love. Tell me, when you grieve, whom are you grieving for? Who's lost? Self-pity? Oh, don't call it that. You're telling the truth now. Here's the formula. If you were not actively engaged in making yourself miserable, you would be happy. We were born happy. All life is shot through with happiness. Oh, there's pain. Of course there's pain. Who told you you can't be happy without pain? Come and meet a friend of mine who's dying of cancer. And she's happy in pain. So, we were born happy. We lost it. We were born with the gift of life. We lost it. We got to rediscover it. Why did we lose it? Because we were working actively. They taught us to work actively to make ourselves miserable. How did they do that? By teaching us to become attached. By teaching us to have desires so intense that we would refuse to be happy unless they were fulfilled. The tragedy is, my dears, the tragedy is... <laughs> that all you need to do is to sit down for two minutes and just watch how untrue it is that you would be unhappy without A or B or X or Y or whatever. Do you know something? You won't sit, because if you sit, you might see it. You won't sit and look at it. I know I wouldn't. I resisted it for years. You mean if I don't get Mary Jane or I don't get John, I won't be happy? Hey, wait a minute. That's false. Before I met him, I was happy. And you know something? I once fell in love with somebody and then, well, I lost her and I was heartbroken. And what happened? I'm all right now. So she wasn't my happiness after all. Remember the time I was, you were a child and you lost something? And you thought, I'll never be happy without this. What happened? If we gave it to you today, you wouldn't look at it. But why don't we learn? Oh, no, no. We got to live in illusions. It feels good. It gives you a kick, doesn't it? It gives me a kick. We want kicks. We don't want happiness. We want thrills. And whenever you got a thrill, you got an anxiety. Because you might lose it. Or you may not get it. And you got a depression following. You got a hangover. It's so simple as I told you, I could put it down for you in two minutes. Whether you'll hear it is another question. That depends on your own heart. So here it is the world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is attachment desire. 
the uprooting of sorrow is the dropping of attachment. How does one drop it? One only looks and sees that it is based on a false belief. The belief that without this I cannot be happy. That's false. The moment you see it's false, you're free. Good luck to you. May take you one minute, may take you 25 years. But the day you see it, you're free. You're free as a bird. You know, you'll be coming up to give satellite retreats. You'll be talking to presidents. You'll be meeting popes. You won't be one bit phased. You're free. You're free. You're completely free. You'll be making an ass of yourself. And you won't bother. You won't bother to impress any. You know what that means? That you're not bothered to impress anybody? You know what it means? That you don't give a... Is damn a swear word in the United States? Maybe I shouldn't be using it. You don't give a thinker's damn what they think about you and what they say about you. You know what that means? Oh boy, that's freedom. You're not bothered about whether they approve of you or they don't. It's all right. You're happy. You don't approve. All right, too bad. That one failed. We move on. I'm happy. But that's because you've discovered that your happiness does not lie in these things. You've got to see that for yourself. Useless reading a book, useless listening to me. You've got to see it. And of course, you won't see it if you've got the wrong formula. Does this mean dropping of attachments? Does it mean detachment from the material world? No. No. Uh, one uses the material world one enjoys the material world, but one doesn't make one's happiness depend on the material world. Is, is that clear enough? Like, look, what I'm saying is, you really begin to enjoy things when you're unattached, because attachment brings anxiety. If you're anxious when you're holding on to something, you could hardly enjoy it. So, what I'm offering you is not a withdrawal from enjoyment. It's a withdrawal from possessiveness, from anxiety, from tension, from depression at loss of something. We're taught to identify with the sufferings of Christ. How would this uh, link in? with what I was saying about happiness. All right, let me clarify this a bit further. Uh, maybe the best way to do it would be by means of a story. It was a great Zen master, they say, who uh, was reported to have attained enlightenment. And one day his disciples said to him, uh, Master, what did you get from enlightenment? And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you this. Before I was enlightened, I used to be depressed. After I got enlightened, I continued to be depressed. You seem puzzled, huh? <laughs> you see, the depression hasn't changed. His attitude to the depression has changed. He's not saying, I'm not going to be happy till this depression goes away. Because strange as it may seem, you know, you could even be serene and calm and happy while the depression is going on. You're not fighting it. You're not upset about it. You're not irritated about it. You're not trying to... No, you're serene. That's the difference. So can one go through physical hardships and even emotional sufferings, and not be upset about them. That's the key word. That's the operative word. Oh, to find the secret for this. You know something? Happiness cannot be defined. At least I haven't found one. I haven't found a definition. As a matter of fact, you have no idea of what happiness is till you've dropped attachment. So it could only be defined as the dropping of illusion, the dropping 
of attachment. When misery caused by attachment is dropped, happiness is attained. Uh, of course, one could use words like peace, serenity, being above it all, uh, enjoying every moment as it occurs, living in the present. The words, these are words. You don't know what sight is till the eye is unobstructed. You don't know what happiness is until attachment desires are dropped. Then you know. And the words don't matter anymore. Is it possible that either because of one's programming, because of one's culture, or simply because of one's human psyche and body, one would go through all kinds of sufferings and yet somehow be above it all? What do you think? Yes, no, what? <laughs> yes, yes. Before enlightenment, I used to be lonely. After enlightenment, I'm still lonely. But loneliness isn't what it used to be anymore. Let me give you an example to show you what I'm talking about. You see, you've got the clouds and you've got the sky. And many of the Oriental masters will be saying, before this state of what they call enlightenment, or what I'm inviting you to do, to see, before they saw, they would identify themselves with the clouds. And they'd be all caught up in that. After enlightenment, they identify themselves with the sky. Oops, there comes a cloud, black cloud. It comes and goes. I'll show you how this is done this afternoon. Again, it's so simple, it seems incredible. And after a while, you say, hey, about six months since a black cloud came. But you know, I'm not going to make my happiness on, depend on their coming or not coming. Get what I say? What I'm saying? All right, great. Or else what's going to happen now is you're going to be tense about not being depressed. Oh gosh, so now another cause for You're going to get attached to this imaginary state that you call happiness. So what we have to do is watch for those attachments, understand them, see that they are based on a false belief, and they will drop. Then you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, Father, I'm Peter Shea from Fordham Peter, University. Right. Father, you've been saying a lot about being able to experience suffering uh, and depression and yet still be I'm detached from it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand clearly what you're saying, but it seems such a contradiction to say that you can be happy and depressed, since depression, as I've always been taught, is the abs absence of contentment and happiness. I'm still a little unsure about that. That's a good question, Peter. I'm glad you're pressing it, because it'll help me to, to make this a bit clearer. See? Aren't depression and happiness two contradictory states? I think this is what you're saying, right? Yes and no. If for you, happiness means thrills, fun, pleasure, yes, they are contradictory. But thrills, fun, pleasure are not happiness. What are they? They're thrills, they're fun, they're pleasure, they're not happiness. Happiness is a state of non-attachment. You know, for many years I didn't even think such a thing existed. For me, to be happy meant to have fun. To be happy meant to win, to get what you wanted. This is what people ordinarily understand by happiness. Most cultures understand happiness to mean you get what you want, so you're happy. You know the way it is? Yay, I got what I want and I'm happy. But that isn't happiness. That's a thrill. That's getting what you want. 
depression is frequently, not always, not getting what you want. It's the opposite of the thrill. You go in for thrills, you're going to be depressed. It's the other side of the pendulum. Oh, you're going to have to do a lot of thinking on that. It's the thrills that cause the depression. Of course, depressions have physical cause, causes too. So you see, I'm not talking about happiness meaning thrills, fun, pleasure. I'm talking of happiness meaning one is above it all. One is serene. One is not attached to its coming and going. There's one more thing I'll add. The more you fight depression, the worse it gets. Don't resist evil. When they strike you on one cheek, turn and offer the other. When you take away one devil, seven more come. How does one deal with these things by not fighting them? Because the more you fight them, the more you empower them. You know, there's a lovely sentence in the Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, where the Lord Krishna says to Arjun, to the kind of the, the main character in the book, as some of you may probably know, the, the setting, the scene is set on a battlefield. And this young prince is saying, why do I have to get into battle? And the Lord says to him very beautifully, he says, plunge into the heart of battle, plunge into the din of battle and keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord. That's the formula. Plunge into the din of battle and keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord, at peace. Is it possible to get into the din of battle, to fight the good fight and be at peace? Of course it is. Of course it is. All the great mystics attained that. Because if you're not at peace, believe me, you're going to do much more damage than good. Oh, the damage you're going to, to do. You know why? Because it isn't the Lord's battle you're fighting. It's the ego's battle. And the sign that you will know that it isn't the ego, the cause is a very just one. But when your ego gets messed up in it, oh, gee. So there it is. You could get right into the battle. I'll have more to say about this in the next session. You get right into remedy situations, but your heart is at peace. And nothing's going to destroy your happiness. Wouldn't it be awful if you fought the good fight and you lost your happiness as a result? Don't have to do that. Right. Does it mean we withdraw from the human endeavor, having no attachment? No, no, no. Plunge into the din of battle. And you know, you have so much more energy, believe me, when you have no attachments. you got all of your energy available to you. The great Chinese sage, Chuang Tzu, how marvelously he puts it. Uh, I remember learning this by heart. Let's see if it comes off. If it doesn't come off, we won't feel bad, will we? Well, let's, let's get started. All right. He says, when the archer shoots for nothing, he has all his skill. When he shoots for a brass buckle, he is already nervous. When he shoots for a prize of gold, he goes blind. He's out of his mind. He sees two targets. His skill has not changed. But the prize divides him. He cares. He thinks more of winning than of shooting. And the need to win drains him of power. Isn't that sublime? The need to win drains him of power. If he didn't need to win, he'd have so much more energy. So no one joins in the human enterprise of human dreams and visions and goals so marvelously and so creatively as the person who's unattached. You know, unfortunately, we've come to associate unattachment with not caring, with not enjoying, with asceticism. No, I'm not talking about that at all. I wouldn't grieve if I wasn't attached. I wouldn't grieve if it were not for my loss. 
I wouldn't grieve if in some way you were not my happiness. But when I enjoy you wholly, I love you in the sense of I'm sensitive, I care, it is your good I see, and I leave you free. And you are not my happiness. I have not given over to you the power to decide whether I will be happy or not. Then I do not grieve at your absence or at your rejecting, at your rejection or at your death. That's hard. You may need many months to digest that one. But until you arrive at this state, all right, grief is wonderful. One drains it out of one's uh, system gradually, and then one comes back to life again. And I'd like to ask this. Before you said we have to watch out for attachments so that we can become unattached. Wouldn't that result in anxieties of constantly worrying about what you're attached to? Uh, yes, How do right. you break this vicious cycle? Okay, all right. No, I wouldn't say watch out, Paul. I'd say watch them, look at them, understand them, study them. Like, how does one detect an attachment? The moment there's upset, there's an attachment lurking under it. Now, you'd say, upset, huh? Hmm. Because uh, you're know, not getting what you want. Mm-hmm. Or you're getting what you don't want. That's right. Or you're about to lose what you want. That's right. Which means you're refusing to be happy unless you get what you want. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, you mean if I don't get this, I'm not going to be happy? You mean this is my happiness? You mean a person, a human being cannot be happy without this? Oh, no, he can. She can. There are human beings who are happy without this. This might take you anywhere from two seconds to two or three hours to five or six days where you wouldn't be thinking about this repeatedly, but your mind is going at it. You know, I'll tell you one thing. The moment you dare to expose yourself, even for two seconds, to truth, you're finished. You're finished. Because if you glimpse it even once, something in you will be taking you back to it. That's why maybe something inside of us fears to look. If you see, well, it may take a while, but you'll be driven back again, and you'll be increasingly freed and made happy and liberated. And so again and again, the mystical teachers of the world have been posing this question. They're, they're puzzled. Why are they unhappy? That kind of thing. Why are they scared? That kind of thing. And of course, till one has seen, it makes sense to feel scared. It makes sense to be unhappy. You know, when I talk about fear, I'm not talking about the present response to immediate danger. I'm not talking about that. That the animals have. I'm talking about fear of what's going to come. Fear of what's going to happen. I'm talking about that. And this, the mystics tell us, doesn't exist. In their mind, simply doesn't exist. Boy, what a state to be in. Extraordinary. Well, here we are with these. You know, there's another nice story about this. There's this camel trader, an Arab, who's walking across the Sahara Desert and they pitch tent for the night, and the slaves, uh, you know, drive pegs into the ground, ground and tie the camels to the pegs. Then they come in to say to the master, "There's only there are only 19 pegs, and we've got 20 camels. How do we tie the 20th camel?" And the master said, "These camels are stupid animals. Just go through the motions of tying the camel, and he'll stay put all night." Which is what they did, and the camels stood there, you know, convinced of it. <laughs> And next morning, when they uh, lifted tent and they continued on their journey, the slaves came to complain. 
that all the camels were following except this one. This one refused to budge. And the master said, you forgot to untie him. They said, oh, yes. So they went through the motions of untying him. That is an image of the human condition. We're scared about things that are not. We're tied to things that don't exist. They're illusions. They're falsehoods. They're beliefs. They're not realities. The agonies we go through over things that we have, we have convinced ourselves our happiness depends upon. But it doesn't. It just doesn't. And we don't want to see it. Again, the mystics, I mean, I guess they understand this because they went through this themselves. They're in amazement that the human being would deceive himself or de people would fool themselves in this way. Now, you know, what I'm going to offer you today is the beginning. You don't need anyone else to, to show you the way. If you keep following this, as I said to you in the previous session, you just get a glimpse of this and you keep at it, you'll find the way and sooner or later you'll discover what this means. You're tied to things that don't exist. They don't exist. There's one of these beetles, Lenin I think his name is, uh, I read a marvelous sentence of his, marvelous sentence. He says, life is something that happens to us while we're engaged in something else. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Life is something that happens to us while we're busily engaged in something else. Worse, life is something that happens to us while we're busy suffering all sorts of other things. And I have a perfect image for this. You've got a concert hall. There's a symphony that's going on. Uh, the orchestra is playing. You've settled down nice and nicely and comfortably in your seat, kind of the dark atmosphere, and you're getting ready to, to hear the music and to enjoy it. And then suddenly you remember that you forgot to lock your car. Oh, gosh, what do you do now? You can't get out. It would be too disturbing. You cannot enjoy the music, and you're caught in between. That is the image of life for most people. Constant anxiety. What do I do now? What's going to happen next? How do I cope with this? How do I deal with that? Oh, you seem to recognize that. Yeah. yeah. You mean, is another condition possible? It is. It is. It is. You're upset. What is it that upset you? Somebody died Somebody betrayed you, someone rejected you, you lost something, your plans have gone awry, something's gone astray, whatever. Can you think right now, even as I'm talking, of something that has upset you in the recent past? Go on, do it. I'm going to give you three or four seconds to do that. Think of something that has upset you in the recent past or is upsetting you right now. Then get your soul ready for a shock. Here it comes. I say it just like it is. I'm going to throw the lob the bomb right into your midst. midst. Listen to this. Nothing in reality, nothing in life, nothing in the world, upsets you. Nothing has the power to upset you. Did anyone tell you that? All upset exists in you, not in reality. You could underline the word all. All of it, all of it, all of it. All upset is in you, not in life, not in reality. Not in the world, it's in you. Uh, just understanding this has changed the lives of people, I mean, 180 degrees round. Just understanding this and no more. Reality is not upsetting. Reality 
is not problematic. If there were no human mind, there would be no problem. <laughs> All problems exist in the human mind. All problems are created by the mind. Now, to me, this is a truth so simple, a seven-year-old child could understand it. But I've met people, you know, who are doctors and, and all sorts of things, but they never, never understood it. Never understood it. They just took for granted that problems exist in the world. Problems exist, or by problem I mean something that upsets you, okay? I'll repeat that. By problem, I mean something that upsets you. They think it exists in the world. They think it exists in other people. They think it is in life. No, no, no. It's in them. As simple as that. Nothing has the power to upset you. You're planning a picnic on Sunday and the picnic gets rained out. Where do you think the upset is? In the rain or in you? In the rain or in your reaction to the rain? I'll repeat that. The upset feeling is not caused by the rain, but by your reaction to the rain. Someone else would react differently. No upset. Of course, you can see that I'm building on this morning's statement. If you had not made your happiness depend on it's not raining, you wouldn't react this way, right? But you've been trained, you and I have been trained to make our happiness depend on certain things. And so when those things don't happen, thanks to our training, thanks to our programming, thanks to that false belief, if this doesn't happen, I'm not going to be happy. Well, what do you know? We, we upset ourselves. Some very interesting examples of this. Let me give you examples from other cultures. Huh? Last summer, a friend of mine here in New York told me a very interesting, uh, uh, gave me a little anthropological detail of a tribe in Africa. He said, you know, their method of awarding the death penalty is the following. They don't have any electrical chair, electric chair. They don't have death by hanging. They have death by banishment. So you belong to the tribe and uh, you have committed a capital offense and you're banished. And uh, this friend of mine said, when this, the sentence of banishment is read, within a week or so, the person dies. Would you die if somebody read a sentence of banishment on you? I wouldn't. I don't think you would either. Would you? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, we might feel it, right? I mean, we're banished to another place. But we wouldn't die, for heaven's sake. They die. Literally. Suppose I said to the judge, the banishment killed him. The banishment did not kill him. It was his belief, his culture, his indoctrination, his programming that killed him. I'll give you a, a little bit of a break, and I'll give you an exercise on this. And some of you are going to experience it right here in this room. Watch. Something has upset you. Did you hear that expression? Something has upset you. That's the way the English language is. That's the way all languages are. Something upset me. Nothing upsets you. The accurate way to speak would be, I upset myself on the occasion of something. But who speaks like that? So you upset me. No, no, no. Your behavior occasioned my upsetting myself. But we hate it, don't we? We love to make the world responsible or people responsible or life responsible or God responsible. You did it. Not the upset. Not the upset. Uh, are you getting some inkling of what it would mean if you really grasped this, you'd be above it all. That's how, that's one nice definition 
of spirituality. Spirituality means to no longer be at the mercy of any event or any person or anything. Hey, I didn't say not to love people. I said you're not at their mercy anymore. You're no longer at the mercy of any event or of any person or of anything. In other words, no matter what happens, you no longer upset yourself. Life is passing you by while you're sitting in that concert hall, unable to enjoy the music, unable to lock the car, caught in between. If someone died, so here's an example, okay? Someone dies and I'm upset. What upset me? The death of this person. No, if I'm upset by it, I've been programmed to be upset when someone dies. Now, take your time for that. That goes against everything your culture and mine has taught us. We've been taught to upset ourselves when we lose somebody. We've been trained to upset ourselves when someone rejects us disapproves of us, leaves us, dies on us. We've been, here it goes, get ready for a scandalous sentence. We've been trained to depend emotionally on people. To not be able to live emotionally without people. I stress emotionally. So, well, naturally, I'm upset because someone I was attached to has died. The death upset me. Mm -mm. On the occasion of this, I have been trained to upset myself. It sounds almost blasphemous, huh? It's awful. I see someone on the street who doesn't have enough to eat. Is that an evil? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes, obviously. Ought I to do something about it in as much as I can? Yes or no? Good, great. So far you're getting all the right answers. I'm going to catch you. Watch out. Third, do I need to upset myself in order to swing into action and do something about it? Great, my, yeah, 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 you're getting A's everywhere. You know, there's an assumption that if you don't upset yourself, if you don't train people to upset themselves, they're not going to do anything. But look, here's someone who doesn't have enough to eat, and that's a calamity. Now you've gone and upset yourself. We got two calamities. <laughs> Could we, could we deal with this calamity without having another one added? But you know, lots of people cannot even conceive of their swinging into action without their first upsetting themselves. It's something like this. You're standing in a line. Somebody breaks the line. Uh, now look, you want to take action? That's fine. You want to say it's wrong? You're right. You want to do something about it? Do. You want to push him away, that's fine. But you know what you're doing? You're saying, you've misbehaved, so I'm going to punish myself. Look how logical this is, okay? Because when I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we say, I say to people, why do you have to get upset? They say, that isn't human. It isn't human. Look what you're doing. He misbehaved, right? So good. So what you're going to do is raise your blood pressure, lose your peace of mind, miss your sleep tonight. Say, look, since you misbehaved, I'm going to... I, why, why would you punish yourself? You're innocent. But you think people would understand this. I mean, educated people, so-called reasonable people, their culture is built on this. How could you not upset yourself? You mean you're not upset? No. But you're planning to do something, evidently. Oh, yeah, very much so. But you're not upset. No, why should I upset myself? Why should I punish myself? Because he misbehaved. Uh... 
plunge into the din of battle and keep your heart at, the, at peace at the lotus feet of the Lord. Get into the din of battle. But there's a fear, see. The people who trained us, the people who programmed us, feared that if we didn't upset ourselves, we wouldn't do anything. It never occurred to them to realize that when you upset yourself, you have less energy to do something and you have less perception. You're not seeing things right anymore. You're overreacting. Every time, oh, let's, let's word it this way. Nothing in all of this world has the power to upset you. Nothing. As a matter of fact, nothing has ever upset you. Nobody has ever hurt you. How about that one? My, you're not going to like this. Oh, no. You mean nobody hurt me? I mean, oh. No, no one ever hurt you. You stupidly hurt yourself. Now, that brings me to part two. Oh, they didn't hurt me, right? Reality didn't hurt me, right? So I cannot lash out against them. So who did the damage? Oh, me. Me hurt me? Yeah, and I'm going to lash out against me. I'm going to hate me for doing this. You getting what I'm saying? Why do I do this? I'm getting angry with me. I'm getting upset with me. What do you know now? Well, I got good news for you. They didn't do it to me. The world didn't do it to me. Life didn't do it to me. And best of all, I didn't do it to me. Isn't that wonderful? Then who done it? <laughs> Look, honest to goodness, would any of you in your right mind sit down and knowingly and willingly and deliberately upset yourselves? Come on. Do you think any of you would do that? No, we wouldn't. We're not going to upset ourselves deliberately. It's as if this is something beyond our control, right? So stop blaming yourself. This has been stamped into you. You've been programmed into this. You've been conditioned this way. This is what you've got to understand. You see, you don't have to do anything for enlightenment. You don't have to do anything for liberation and for spirituality. All you have to do is to see something, understand something. If you would understand it, you'd be free. You know, one of the signs of maturity, my dears, is the following. Very hard to define maturity. But I've come up with a fairly workable definition. Maturity is when you no longer blame anyone. You don't blame others, you don't blame yourself. You see what's wrong and you set about remedying it. That's one pretty good sign of maturity. You know, you'd be amazed how childish people are. They're so childish. I mean, if you've seen a little child, as a matter of fact, you can almost take for granted that in its present state of lunacy, 99.999% of humanity is childish. Just hang around. Hang around for half a day. You'll find our greatest men and women indulging in acts of childishness. Utterly childish. You know the way a child behaves? A little kid, I don't know about here in the States, but in India, I mean, uh, they bump their knee into a, a, a table and they're saying, wow, and everybody goes, who hit you? The table? Naughty table. Naughty table. I'm so oh, table, naughty table. And then the kid's feeling good. See how childish that is? Huh? 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 So they're coming to you and say, now who hit you? My wife, my husband, my superior. Aren't they awful? They're terrible. And the little baby's feeling good. And he's the president of whatever big association or country or whatever. Oh my God, how, how childish can a, a person get? And they don't know their childishness. they got to blame somebody. But no, 
Maturity is to understand that no one is to blame. Or better still, more accurately put, not to give yourself the childish emotional outlet of blaming others or yourself, but rather seeing what went wrong and setting about remedying it. Do something about it. See? So, they're not to blame. You're not to blame. It's the programming that's doing this to you. When you're able to do this repeatedly, again and again, the general universal experience is the following. Gee, this thing upset me. First step. Second step. Uh-uh, it wasn't this thing that upset me. It was my programming that upset me. Oh, so I don't have to deploy all of my energies fighting that outside thing, right? All right, right. I don't have to spend all my emotional energies blaming that outside thing. That's right. Funny, this thing gets, gets depleted. It keeps going down. You know, because as long as I've got an enemy out there who's upsetting me, I'm demanding that that change. I'm refusing to give up my upset unless that thing change. Am I clear enough? Now comes the big, pardon me, huh? I don't mean to be insulting or anything, but you're going to enjoy this. Now comes the big American question. How do we fix it? <laughs> like, okay, he's not upsetting me. I'm not upsetting me. The programming is upsetting me. How do I fix this? You know the big oriental answer? You don't fix it. You let it be. It'll go away. The more you try to fix it, the stronger it gets. Gee, that's another mind-blowing thing. Don't fix it. Let it be. Let it be. It'll go away. It really will. If you've seen this, if you've seen, but don't I need to know where this programming comes from? It's a help. It's a help, but not necessary. And if you're hell-bent on getting it, I've got to find it out where it comes from, and I've got to change it, you're going to make it worse. You can be sure of that. Lots of people never change because they're so determined to change. They're so determined that they never change. They're so tense, they're so anxious that it gets worse. So here's another thing that particularly people in the West and in the East, we're all the same. You know, the kind of stuff I give you here, I give in Japan and I give in India and I give in Spain and Latin America and everywhere and everywhere the people are the same. You've got a thin veneer of culture that's different, but deep down we're all the same. Same problems everywhere. The hatred is the same. The conflict is the same. The guilt is the same. The, the dependence on people's opinion and on the emotional dependence on approval is the same. It's exactly the same. Just scrape off the, the exterior culture, we're all the same. Now, everywhere people are trying to fix it too. How do I change it? You don't change it. You understand it. You look at it. You observe it. It'll take care of itself. Then what happens is you don't change it. Life changes it. Nature changes it. The way you don't heal yourself, nature heals itself. You just do something to aid nature. So it isn't the person who has upset you. It isn't you who have upset yourself. It's your programming. All you have to do is understand this and distance yourself from it. Understand it. You want to do something about that programming? If you can, fine. Is it necessary? No. If you're understanding it, you know it comes from your programming, not from you, not from them. It'll take care of itself. It really will. You'll be amazed that after a few months, things that before would have made you sick with anxiety or with suffering or with, with whatever, you can take in your stride with perfect peace. You're quite relaxed about it. That's the spiritual life. That's dying to yourself, dropping that programming.
You drop it by understanding it for what it is. Call it by its name. When someone comes to you and is all upset about, uh, let's say, she or he is a victim of crime, and they're all upset, or let's say uh, someone's mother has died and is full of grief, and you don't take the attitude of, oh, you're grieving, you're upset, there's something wrong with, oh, no, 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 you understand. Look, this poor person, even if the grief or if the grief comes from an attachment, if the pain, the isolation comes from an attack, this poor person isn't causing it. Have you understood that? Have you understood me to say that? They're not causing it. We could sympathize with them. We could understand them. We can be compassionate with them. And gently, when they're ready, explain where it's coming from. Because ultimately, we're not being compassionate if we don't give them the secret someday or other. Am I clear enough there? Like, see, you've come to me and you're very upset because someone has injured you. Well, I'll understand you. I'll understand where you're coming from. I'll be compassionate towards you. But someday, sometime, somewhere, if you're ready, I'll slip you the secret. That, to me, would be true compassion. You don't have to be this way. There's another way. Isn't it the people around us who have programmed us when we were young? They have. But poor dears, they didn't set out with any malice to do this to us. They're the victims of what other people had done to them. You understand? So we're not swearing at them. We're not yelling at them. Again and again, I get people come to me who are so upset about their parents. They can't forgive their parents. They hate their parents. All right, I understand. I'm not saying that your parents did right or they did wrong. Maybe they did wrong. All right. But look, could you understand them? Because that's what love is all about, see? Love is not blaming others. Love is not judging others. Love is not condemning others. Love is understanding. Can you understand where they came from? Can you understand how there's so little malice there and so much ignorance and so much goodwill and so much helplessness and so much programming and so much confusion and so much fear? Have you ever paused to understand this? Oh, then you'll understand what it means to love. That'll change you too. The world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is attachment. The uprooting of sorrow is the dropping of attachment. The understanding that attachment is a false belief. The false belief that any thing or person can make you happy. True happiness is caused by nothing. True happiness is uncaused. If you ask the mystic why he or she is happy, the answer will be, why not? No block, no obstruction. Why not? Have you ever thought that if something causes your happiness, when you lose that something, your happiness will be destroyed? Has it ever occurred to you that if something causes your happiness, you will become possessive of that thing? You will become anxious lest you lose it? Whatever that thing be, learning, reputation, good health, life itself. How interesting. The rediscovery of life. You will never live till you stop clinging to life. Let go. When you cling, happiness dies. If your happiness depends on anyone or anything, 
That's not happiness, my dears. That's anxiety. That's tension. That's pressure. That's fear. The Japanese have a powerful tale for this. Oh, it's so powerful. There's this guy who's running away from a tiger, comes to a precipice, and quite unwittingly, he, he begins to slide down that precipice. And as he's sliding, he grabs hold onto the branch of a tree that's growing there, a kind of a bush. And then he looks down. There's no way of climbing up. And anyway, there's the tiger waiting for him, for him there. And if he slides down, he slides down to his death 15,000 feet. What does he do? He, he has a few minutes to live. Well, he looks at that bush he's holding on to, and he finds it's a berry bush. And he's holding on to it with one hand, and he plucks the berry bush, the, a berry from the bush with the other, puts it into his mouth, and tastes it. And the story goes, and it tasted so sweet. Isn't that marvelous? I know friends of mine in the past, two of them at different intervals, who were dying and who said to me, I began to truly taste life and see how sweet it was when I let go. And I realized that life is ending. It was then that it began to taste sweet. We see people not as they are, but as we are. And it's amazing, you know, how in the beginning we saw rude people. Then when we change, we see frightened people. They're so scared, poor things. They're driven to hostility. Then you're so understanding, you're so compassionate. Whereas before, you'd react with anger, with hate. Hey, wait a minute. Why is he being rude? You're too upset to see. You're too upset to realize. Could we clean you up? Oh, no, no. You've come to me so that I can prescribe medicine for the rest. And so, you see, my dears, we're all in the change business, aren't we? We want to change ourselves. We want to change the world. That's, our, that's what our stupid programming has done to us. We've got to change everything without first understanding anything. What you need is not change. You need understanding. Understand yourself. Understand others. I'm going to say something that's perfectly scandalous, but it's true. You're not here to change the world. You're here to love the world. And by damn, you don't want to love the world. You want to change it. You know what it means to love? What it means to love is to see. To see. You, how can you love what you don't even see? And how can you see when you're upset? How can you see when there's any strong emotion? Here comes another shock positive or negative, coming in the way. They say love is blind. Rubbish! There's nothing so clear-sighted as love. The most clear-sighted thing in the world. Attachment is blind. Because it's stupid. Because it's based on a false belief. And they call that love. I'm in love with you. I love you. What? You love me or you love yourself? You know what in love means? In love means I want you for me. In love, I am in love means I'm possessive of you. To be in love with you means I want you for me. I'm not going to be happy without you. I emotionally depend on you. I can't be happy without you. That's a drug. That's a disease. Your culture and mine tells us it's the supreme virtue. It's garbage. But who dares to say this? You're blind. You're full of yourself when you're in love. Ever thought of that? You don't see the other person. You've projected a hopeful 
image onto that person and that's what you're loving, hopeful. When we're not expecting anything from the other person, we don't say we're in love. Ma, you got lots to meditate on. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm giving you too much. But anyway, there it goes. Relations. You're having trouble relating with others. Take a look at yourself. Ask yourself why you are upset. Where is it coming from? You're programming, that's where. I've sometimes been amazed in the past that people who would irritate me by their behavior don't seem to irritate others who are far, far better than I am. I mean, how come he doesn't get irritated when exposed to this behavior? How come I do? There's something wrong with me. And here I was busy trying to change her or him or them. Now, when I'm not upset, oh, then that's fine. That's fine. Then I might suggest things. I might do things. Now I'm qualified to enter into the change, uh, to, into any activity involving change. But not till then. Not till then. My telescope is out of focus. Oh, there's a great secret for human relations. Uh, how much it has helped me. How much it has helped me. Anytime I'm having trouble with anyone, if I'm upset to say, Hey, Tony, there's something wrong with you. How about you and I sit down and take a good look at it, okay? Okay, but I'm still dying to say, Oh, no, no, you're upset, right? This isn't coming from him, not coming from you, coming from your programming. Oh, wow, well, I see. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's perspective, there's distance, there's understanding, there's love at last. And oh, I could be quite hard. You can be quite hard. Love can be quite hard. But love is fair. Love is just. Love sees. Love is not prejudiced. Okay, so much for human relations. Take a little child. Uh, six months old and inject uh, heroin any drug into the body of this child okay and you keep injecting the drug into this child and after a while the whole body of the child is craving for the drug craving desperately for the drug see it hasn't been brought up on good healthy nutrition it's been brought up on the drug and so when you deprive the child of the drug the poor child goes through the agonies of death, the body of the child. Okay. Ready for a surprise? That's what happened to you and me, to all of us. They drugged us. When we were kids, they didn't bring us up on the healthy, wholesome nourishment of play and work and beauty and the, the pleasures of the senses, and as we grew older, the pleasures of the mind. Oh no, oh no. They gave us a taste for a drug called approval. A drug called success. A drug called making it to the top, achieving. Affirmation, triumph, victory. They gave us power reputation, fame, prestige. They gave us this drug. And you know something? We began to feel good. It was kind of a giddy feeling, a great feeling when they were applauding us. And we started thinking, well, it was great to be famous. It was great to be successful. It was great to be made much of. It was great to be popular. Result, as we began to grow, they could control us any way they liked, you know. All you have to do is with withhold the drug. Boy, if you haven't gone through this, I salute you. They don't approve of you. How uneasy you feel. How restless. They criticize you. Uh, they're not affirming you. Withdrawal symptoms. You're crawling back for reassurance. And your psychologists are writing books telling you, this is the way to be. <laughs> this is the way to be. More of the drug, more control. 
Now, you know, as a result of doing this, you've lost your ability to love. Because when you need someone, you cannot love that person. Do you know why? Because you can't see that person anymore. When a politician needs votes, he stops seeing people. When a business woman or a business man becomes crazy over money, they stop seeing people. When I want something out of you, I'm not seeing you. I want to get something out of you. And you know, my dears, it's so bad that 24 hours of the day, consciously or unconsciously, we want something from the people around us. We want their approval. We dread their disapproval. We're scared they'll reject us. We're scared of what they think of us. How could you love people like this? When you're so dependent on them emotionally. Oh, we've got to depend on one another, they'll tell you grandly. Of course we've got to depend on one another. We de that's how society is built up. We share the labor, we share our charisms. That's marvelous. I have nothing against that kind of dependence. The evil is to depend on another for your happiness. To depend on another for learning, for technicians or technical skill, for food. That's fine. That's fine. For cooperation in the work. That's wonderful. To depend on another for your happiness. That's the evil. Now you cannot love. Give it a thought later. When you have time and leisure, until you stop depending on others, till you die to the need for people, when you first get in touch with this, you know it's terrifying because you suddenly become alone. Not lonely, alone. It's a strange feeling. You suddenly understand what you've been all along, but you never saw it. And you suddenly realize how lovely it is to be alone, not to need others emotionally. And for the first time you understand that you can love people. You don't need to bribe them. You don't need to manipulate them. You don't need to impress them. You don't need to placate them. At last you can love. And for the first time in your life, you are incapable of loneliness. You cannot be lonely anymore. You know what loneliness means? It means a desperate need for people. To the point that you're unhappy without people. Loneliness is not cured by human company. Loneliness is cured by contact with reality. By understanding that we don't need people. We don't need them. At last you can enjoy them because you don't need them. There's no tension. You know what it means to be with people? And to have no tension, because you don't give a damn whether they like you or they don't like you, what they think of you. You know what that means? Oh, what a freedom. What a joy. They could think what they want. They could say what they want. That's all right. You're not affected. You got the drug out of your system. And oh, yes, you're still in the world, but you're no longer off it. They can't control you anymore. And all of a sudden... You have nowhere to rest your head. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have their nests. But you're not resting your head anywhere, you don't need to. Because you don't cling anymore. That's when love begins. Well, I've given you so much to meditate on. It's quite a wrap up, huh? <laughs> Guess I got carried away. I'll end with a little parable, and uh, which if I had to choose one of the thousands of stories I know, I would choose, well, I would call my favorite story. There was a lion who, was, who grew up in a flock of sheep and had no consciousness that he was a lion. What do you know? He didn't know he was a lion. 
And one day, you know, he would bleat like a sheep, he'd eat grass like a sheep. And one day they were wandering at the edge of a big jungle when a mighty big lion let out a roar and he leaped out of the forest and right into the middle of the flock. And all the sheep scattered and ran away. And imagine the surprise of the jungle lion when he saw this lion there among the sheep. So he gave chase and he got hold of him. And there was this lion cringing in front of the, the king of the jungle. And the lion said to him, what are you doing here? And the guy said, sorry, have mercy on me. Don't eat me. Have mercy on me. But the, the king of the forest dragged him with him. Come on with me. And he took him to a, a lake. And he said, look. So the lion who thought he was a sheep looked. And for the first time, he saw his reflection. He saw his image. Then he looked at the other lion. And he looked in again. And he let out a mighty roar. He was never a sheep again. Took one minute. Well, my dears, maybe in the course of all my talking, one or other of you will have looked and seen through all this network of lies and conditionings and programmings that we've been subjected to and has had some inkling into who they are. Well, then this day will have been worthwhile. I certainly thank all of you for coming here. It really has been a joy to talk to you people. And maybe someday, somewhere, we'll meet again. Thank you.